business and usual i'm mona lisa dube and thank you for staying with us here on zfm stereo where we are celebrating 10 years of existence a decade of great music entertainment and great content and this evening we are going to be looking at the business aspect of zfm stereo my guest this evening is the founder of zfm stereo honorable superman Wanzira. thank you so much for making time to have this conversation with us well i must thank you uh, for inviting me to be on the program uh, it's not uh, very often that i am uh, uh, on this station as a guest absolutely uh, always on the other side where you are sitting so i appreciate thank you very much for inviting me to to speak about this very uh, historical moment where ab communications uh, you know, a uh, uh, flagship child, uh, ZFM, mm -hmm. is uh, celebrating 10 years of uh, broadcasting. Right. So I, I just need to make a disclaimer before we start. I mean, my guest this evening is my boss. So you can understand the power dynamics in studio. So I need your assurance, Honorable, on national radio, that what ne whatever happens in this interview, I get to keep my job. Well, as long as you're professional in this interview, I don't see why you should even be worried about your job. And it should never be about who you're interviewing. It must always be about integrity, about professionalism, about how you approach the interview. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to take any person and I'm happy to be uh, uh, fired from all angles as long as it is within the professional bounds. So I absolutely will assure you and nation that uh, nobody gets uh, uh, fired on this station uh, mm -hmm. or on any of our platforms simply because they have uh, uh, asked some very tough questions to a guest. Uh, we pride ourselves in the attitude that whatever we do must always have balance. You must always give the other side of the story, not just continue on one side. So as long as we are maintaining that, everybody's within their rights to do whatever they feel they want. Great. So now that we have that out of the way, we can um, get the, the conversation started. So congratulations, uh, ZFM, 10 years, it's a big deal. I mean, especially in the Zimbabwean context. But I know that most of us know the ZFM story from the 15th of August, 2012, but it obviously doesn't start there. Absolutely. Yes, so can you walk us through the journey building up to the 15th of August, 2012? Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you, you say congratulations, but I think the congratulations is to uh, the whole ZFM family. Uh, I think that uh, we owe it to the entire team that was uh, behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, when we went on air on the 15th of August, 10 years ago. Uh, we owe it to uh, the many people that uh, have grown to like this station, to be the fans of ZFM, uh, who are both in Zimbabwe and outside of our country. We owe it to our bankers who have supported this initiative uh, uh, financially. We owe it to the friends who, when it was difficult to find money from the bank, were able to lend us money in order to start this station. We owe it to uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the staff that uh, you know, worked tirelessly when we started, it, it, some of it without salaries at the beginning, uh, to be able to uh, sustain something that would then last this long. So we owe it to a variety of stakeholders. And I wanna say to them as well, congratulations, uh, your baby is 10 years old uh, today. You asked about the background. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of work went through it. As you will know, my, my background is, my training generally uh, is, is journalism. Right. I studied media at Harare Polytechnic. I, uh, I, I, I went on to study in the, in the UK uh, where I, I did my master's in international journalism at City University, again, ma majoring in, 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 in journalism and uh, uh, economic and financial reporting. So I always uh, uh, have, was interested in developing myself uh, in that field. Right. Uh, but I also looked at myself as an entrepreneur. And I, I cherished the moment that Zimbabwe would open up the airwaves to allow private broadcasters to come into play. And the moment came more than 10 years ago. And uh, Which year was this? Uh, this was uh, uh, minus almost 11 years from now, because that's when uh, the tenders were done to go on air. Uh, to, I mean, to, to invite people who wanted to, to, to have a radio station to apply and then go through the process with the Broadcasting Authority of Zimbabwe. So when uh, it all started, uh, the Broadcasting Authority of Zimbabwe uh, flighted uh, the advert that those that were interested should apply. One of the things that I realized was that as a person, 
as a business person, I did not have sufficient insights to understand how to set up a business plan that would win the hearts and minds of, of the adjudicators and the broadcasting authority of Zimbabwe. So what I decided to do was to go outside of Zimbabwe. I didn't want to hire somebody from ZBC to do a business plan for me because I, I then thought that the station would be as good as... Would sound ZBC. Would be ZBC. So what I did is I went to uh, South Africa. I uh, looked at uh, some of the uh, big names in the media industry in South Africa. I landed at KPMG South Africa, uh, where the head of media advisory services was a gentleman called Quentin Green, who had run SABC at some point. And uh, I engaged uh, with uh, uh, KPMG South Africa. I hired them in order to put together a winning document. So you going out to look for expertise in South Africa, does it suggest that we don't have people locally that have an understanding of building what would be a media empire? I think that you will understand that we had a monopoly of ZBC in the broadcasting sector. And therefore, the only experience you would know or the only experience people you would engage or interact with were people who had worked for ZBC. Right. And I understood that the market wanted something different from ZBC because they already had ZBC. So I had to look for another flavor from a different country in terms of how to package a business plan and how to package a broadcasting channel that would excite the audiences. So it wasn't to look down on the skills available. It was also to understand that our exposure in terms of radio broadcasting was limited to ZBC. And therefore, we needed to go into a market that was competitive with multiple channels. So obviously, the standard would have been higher. And that was the, the outcome anyway. When we engaged with Quentin Green, we spent uh, hours, weekends at his house. And he was very kind. You know, We paid for it, but he went beyond uh, the call of duty, uh, putting together a winning document. Uh, and, and when it came to the day of uh, presenting, he flew in. We flew him in from South Africa. So the presenters of our proposal was myself and Quentin Green. So we had we did our homework to make sure that uh, we would land the license. So you brought in, I, uh, when the station started off, you brought in celebrities, the likes of Sindhu Mnyavi, Plaxilis Wenyika, Sani Makalima. And this was a fest in Zimbabwe. This is not something that we'd see common. What was your thought process in that? Okay, so, so what, what I realized was um, we needed to harness the uh, skill and talent available in the country. We also needed to bring in people who already had their name who would be followed. Who had an audience. With an audience, yeah. Uh, and and what, we, what I didn't want to do was to go and pick the voices that we had from ZBC. We didn't want to go and pick the voices that we had heard on Radio 3. I was more interested in identifying new talent or taking talent that had never been thought of as radio talent mm -hmm. and put them on radio. Uh, if you remember, the only people we brought in from outside of, uh, 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 from ZBC uh, were uh, TK and Kimber Rogers and Ozia Sengende. Ozia Sengende was in Malawi. Kimber Rogers was no longer on radio and TK. Why did we need these people? We needed them for their, for their experience and we needed to give confidence to the other guys who were in. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we were very lucky uh, in order, in terms of programming uh, and training, to also bring in uh, uh, Tony Friday. Tony Friday, they had experience in the region, again, training in other countries. So we felt we could also bring this talent back and train our people. So that was the, the mm -hmm. thinking. We brought in the celebrities so that the audiences would like, oh, let's tune in to this station where Cindy is a, is a presenter. Mm -hmm. That was the idea. So... Any business venture, any media venture is capital intensive and radio is no exception. How did you bankroll ZFM? Okay, so this is one of our biggest challenges. When we got the license, we went to the local banks. Nobody was willing to lend us any money. We didn't have any uh, significant assets. Uh, prior, I was running a production company called Mighty Movies. Uh, and that was about it. And the kind of monies we needed to set up, ran into millions of US dollars. Mm -hmm. So it was a very difficult to convince the banks. So while we were the first one to be given the document, so our license is 00001, that's our license number, which means we were the first 
privately owned radio station to be licensed in this country. Mm-hmm. But we were behind uh, our colleagues at Star FM in setting up because Star FM had a big company listed on the stock exchange. So the funding wasn't difficult for them. Funding you were to some extent a startup. We were, we were pretty much a startup. Mm-hmm. So, so what happened was that, and, and this is always a funny story because I, I always repeat it because uh, it says a lot about human beings. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> there are a couple of people we identified who would make a huge difference to this station. and In terms of? In terms of being talent on air. Right. And then uh, we, we went uh, out looking for money. So it took us some time before we could get money. And Sorry. So at this stage, uh, has ZFM start? Has it set up already, or you are? St- we, we have a document. Just have, the document. We have the document that we are now licensed. Now we must put money. Right. Now we had identified people, and then we said we need this one, we need that one, because when you apply for the license, you have to tell them how you're going to do your broadcast. Absolutely. So we 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 were late in going on air. Star FM was ahead of us, and they were already starting. They then targeted some of the people we wanted to hire. I remember I was in uh, in Las Vegas at the uh, National Association of Broadcasters forum where we were attending and looking at the various options for equipment. And I received a call from um, uh, one of our, the guys we had targeted to say, ah, my brother, I'm really sorry, but I've been offered something by Star FM. Mm-hmm. I waited, but uh, it looks like you're just a mm-hmm. But I am uh, so grateful, and I always say this story, uh, one of the guys was approached, and uh, it's TK. He it mm-hmm. was approached by again by some guys, and they were told, "You, uh, we understand who needed the station here, super. Mm-hmm. Uh, we want you on our side." Uh, and super um, anachin, what are you waiting for? I mean, that is not going anywhere. And uh, TK's response to to those guys was, "Well, if he doesn't have anything, he now has me, so I'm his asset." So, so, and you still have him to this day. I still have him to you to this day, and I'm uh, so grateful for that kind of loyalty right. by a human being to a to a to a to a vision. Right. And so we were talking about how you so, bankrolled. So, 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 so the I station. wanted to say that uh, it was very difficult to get mm-hmm. started. We actually lost people because we didn't have the money. Right. So I was then talking to friends, and I met um, uh, through uh, 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 a friend. I met a gentleman from South Africa. He was doing a lot of business in this country, selling mining spares and other things. He was owed a lot of money in Zim and he hadn't been paid. And he was told about my story. And he's a man who believes in God. And he he said, I- I'd love to, to support because I have a lot of money sitting in Zim anyway, which these companies are not paying. So I'm willing to give some of that money because it's, it's a local currency anyway, a part of it. Right. So... Uh, he gave us a loan to, 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 to get our equipment in. So when we were looking for quotations for equipment, we were getting so expensive equipment. Until I was searching on the internet, I realized there's a big event that happens annually uh, in, uh, in Las Vegas, which brings together all the broadcasters globally, all the uh, broadcast equipment manufacturers. And I decided, no, we need to go there. Sorry, which platform. month and which year are we, are we now at? Now, if you if you if you consider that we are ten years old mm-hmm. and we are in twenty twenty two, so we were in twenty twenty two. Obviously, but the so launch station was is, in August. So we were licensed around uh-huh. November twenty eleven, right? We were licensed, but we needed we didn't, we had enough time to to go on air. Mm-hmm. So this was happening around February of twenty April February uh, of twenty twelve. Right, that's when we were. Uh, looking for money and that's where we're looking for uh, where to buy equipment. I think it's important to just put our listeners into perspective. I I, I totally agree Mm -hmm. with you. So we we got the license. We were, you know, we got a letter Mm -hmm. to simply say you have one, you know, the right to set up a a thing, a a broadcasting station. What you now need to do is you need to pay this amount so that you can be given your, uh, your license. And then you have this time frame in which to set up. Right. So we were now battling uh, with the timelines to make sure that at least we go on air before uh, the license expires, before it is actually activated. So we were looking for equipment. We got so huge quotations. I remember we got some studio equipment that was almost around uh, uh, three, four hundred thousand US dollars. And 
and I I was searching on the internet and I realized that there was this NAV. So I said to Susan McCoy, who was one of the uh, um, founding uh, 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 CEOs here, I said to Susan McCoy and our chief engineer, Atwell Sitole, we're going to buy tickets and go to Las Vegas and find who can supply us equipment cheaper than we are being quoted. And true to that prediction, when we went to Las Vegas, we found the companies that were quoting us. We found them exhibiting there. We found them selling the same equipment they are selling us at double the price, at 50% of the price. In fact, at less than 50% of the price because it's a competitive environment. Right. That's when we realized that Africa suffers from this situation where it's overpriced in anything. So I think the guys in Europe, when you send you a quotation, they say these Africans don't understand, they'll pay any amount of money. So we were going to pay more than 500,000 for studios. We ended up paying about maybe 200, 250,000 because we went to Las Vegas. So I was saying to Susan and Atwell, our mission is to get a discount equivalent to the price of our tickets. And then so that you trip, recover the so cost. The trip would have been worthwhile, mm -hmm. but we got more than what we bargained for. So we're very proud. So, so we got this funding from from this colleague, and uh, it was very it was godsend to be very frank mm -hmm. with you because we didn't expect. And no one was money. believing in the vision at the nobody time. Nobody believed in the vision. Nobody had the money. The people who had promised that they would give us money, last minute yeah. they bailed out, and it was just it was so difficult to get mm -hmm. to get ourselves started. But you know, when something is meant to happen, it will always happen. Yeah, 10 years, we're sitting here. Absolutely. So uh, I've hosted a number of entrepreneurs in this show and they talk about how they started their business. And one of the major issues that they bring up is it takes a while for a business to actually uh, recover that profit and for it to make sense. So at what stage did you actually start uh, seeing that you would profit from ZFM Stereo? Okay, here's an interesting story. So as we were preparing uh, to set up, to go on air, we hired, again, a South African um, uh, professional expert who had run radio stations, including Heifeld uh, in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, we brought him in to train our guys uh, in terms of radio, what is radio, how do we structure our programming, and how do we you know, source advertising. And um, he told us, whatever money you have put in, you need about three years in order to recover the money and start making some profit. Mm -hmm. We invited, was this the case? We invited him uh, one year later. He was surprised and shocked that we were doing much better than he anticipated. Mm -hmm. I think we were we had been able to recover our costs in the shortest time possible. Within eighteen, within twelve to eighteen mm -hmm. months, we were now uh, trading in the positive. Uh, and, and and it is not because we were the smartest of people, but we we just had a committed team mm -hmm. that was able to uh, just see the vision and didn't complain about much. Uh, we had four months of no salaries, but nobody, nobody, and I mean literally nobody, didn't turn up for work. In four months of no salaries because we just didn't have the money. But uh, the guys were committed until the market started believing in ourselves. I remember one of the mobile networks wanted to celebrate its, uh, one of its major products, its 10th anniversary. So they said, please, please go on air because we want to go in and celebrate with you. So go on air, go on air, push, push, push. So we pushed, we pushed, we got on air. We went back to the mobile operator and said, we are now on air. They never gave us any business. So we said, wow, after putting on so much effort, mm -hmm. that's when we said, okay, we're not gonna count the business from this mobile operator. Right. If they ever come on board, that's our bonus. We're going to operate without the major advertisers. Our focus is small to medium enterprises, is businesses that are not big spenders. That's our focus for business. Anyone else who's big, who's always spends, when they come on board, is a big bonus. We would love that bonus, but let's not focus so on So that this. was your strategy that made you rip the profits earlier? Absolutely, because we then went for the people who were not normally approached for advertising. Uh, we went to the people who, uh, where, whose door wasn't being knocked by a lot of people who need advertising. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how we started the gaining momentum and gaining space. But mm -hmm. we did get a lot of support from a lot of big corporates, mm -hmm. a lot of the advertising agencies. And we continue to, to have that kind of support today. So you are a member of the ruling party, ZANU-PF. Uh, you've spoken on different public forums, said you're unashamedly and proudly ZANU-PF. I mean, you sit in parliament as a member of parliament for Nyanga South under the ZANU-PF ticket. Do you think that were it not for those political ties, you would have been awarded the license for ZFM? 
I think we have to look at it from this angle. Um, who are we competing with for the license? Uh, we were competing with very well connected people within Zanu PF, who we are competing with. And we're going to give credit to the Broadcasting Authority of Zimbabwe that they gave us the license. Why? Because mm -hmm. 10 years later, we are still here. 10 years later, we have created hundreds of jobs. 10 years later, we have changed the entire music industry. We have taken dancehall music to a totally new level in this country. We have created employment in that entertainment sector because right. we have honored it. So it's, a, it's an important question, but to an extent, an irrelevant question. Because what matters, so? in this game, what matters in this game is your staying power. What matters in this game is sustainability. Have we been able to stay? Have we been able to be sustainable as a business? Absolutely. That's why we're still there. A lot of misgivings were given. Oh, you got the license because you're connected to ZANU PF or you are ZANU PF. Mm -hmm. Well, to start with, my argument has always been, even if you're ZANU PF, you're entitled to be an entrepreneur in your own country. Agreed. Uh, but the question, however, is, were it not for that, if you were an ordinary Zimbabwean, just an ordinary person who wants a license, who's a business person, entrepreneur, you spoke about how you were just walking through your entrepreneurial journey as well. That's the point. Like, were it not for that, I understand, because 10 years we're still here, we're not taking anything away from you as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. However, had it not been for these ties, do you think that, the license will still have been awarded to you Absolutely. as Superman Dwanzira. The license would have been awarded to me, first of all, because this is my passion. This is this is what I trained for. I went to school. I went to Arare Polytechnic, studied uh, a mass communication. I was offered a scholarship by the British Council to go and further uh, 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 my education in media. I worked for ZBC. I worked for the Manika Post. I worked for the Business Herald. I worked for the SABC. I worked for Al Jazeera. I worked for the BBC. Hmm. I do not know anybody else who has my credentials, who I was competing with, who didn't get the license. I know who I was competing with. They did not have the profile, media profile that I have, that I had at that particular moment. They also didn't have a bankable and winning document expertly prepared by an organization well-known globally for their media advisory services, which is KPMG. KPMG globally have a very good foothold in media advisory. And having worked with KPMG South Africa, obviously tapping into the wealth of uh, data within the KPMG global group, we had a document that nobody would be able to beat. So I can state categorically mm -hmm. that I didn't get this license because I was or connected to Zanupia at that particular point. I got this on total merit. And what do I have to prove that? I have 10 years of existence, successful existence as a station. Because if I had gotten it as a, as a, as a political gift, mm -hmm. I'm sure it would have died, we would not have any audiences, and nobody would be listening to, to us because they would have thought, oh, we are a propaganda channel for this political party or that political mm -hmm. party. Mm -hmm. So what is your current role at ZFM? My role is just to provide guidance from a distance. Uh, you know, it's good to, you know, kind of come back 10 years later and say, mm -hmm. what do we do now? Uh, what's, what's, what's going to be the next 10 years? So because I believe that I have the uh, passion and I understand the vision when we set this up, I'm just, I just come back here and there to mm -hmm. pass on that passion, to pass on that vision to the team that is Ably running things here to make sure that uh, we stay the course, that we build not just a local business, but we build a global enterprise. So to what extent does your coming around uh, at ZFM here and there affect the editorial policy? I know earlier on you spoke about how people question and say, oh, is okay, there is a perception that is ZFM really a privately owned station because the founder is on the PF? And um, to what extent does that affect um, or contribute to the editorial policy of the station? I think that's a very important question. Uh, you say people say that ZFM cannot be private because the founder is ZANU-PF. You know, ZANU-PF has a lot of private individuals. Many people in ZANU-PF are private individuals. 
Uh, I think the, the, the unfortunate thing that we have done in this country is to elevate politics to a level that it should never be elevated to. We, we, we give politics so much power when it shouldn't have that power. Uh, we expect so much out of politics when you shouldn't be expecting so much out of politics. So the, the, the point is, it is a private station. Whether you like it or you don't like it, I don't use public funds. I didn't use any public funds in setting up the station. We never got money from the government. We don't get grants from the government. Mm -hmm. The license fee you pay for a radio does not come to us. It goes to the national broadcaster. We get, we get nothing from the state. So we don't use any public funds. We don't use any taxpayers' money. We run as a commercial station. So we are private in that regard. Mm -hmm. We are commercial in that regard. My political affiliation should never be an issue to anybody. Because I'm running a business. Agreed. Many, but to what extent? There, there are many people Hang on, honorable. Hang on, honorable. Of course, I know you indicated that Zanu PF has private individuals, right? Mm -hmm. But those private individuals have affiliations. So, to what extent does your private um, affiliations affect the editorial of the station? Yeah, I was going to come to that part of the question because you asked the two barrel, uh, double barrel question. The first one was. You know, uh, people don't say that this is not a private station. Right. And then the second part is what you have just repeated, which is how do we, how does that affect the editorial direction of the station? I think that again, I want to just refer you to the last ten years. When we got the license, uh, the speculation or the perception was, oh, this is a, an extension of the Zanu PF. This is extension of the BC. They are going to be pushing Zanu PF propaganda. They are going to be uh, pushing a political agenda. We are a commercial station. We are driven by commercial values, commercial uh, expectations, and nothing else. So what goes on the station is what the audiences and what we think mm -hmm. or expect the audiences want to hear. We are not um, blinded by our affiliations. We have a very young workforce here. The majority of them, when I interact with them at a personal level, they don't support my political party. They are not part of my political party. But even if I try to convince them, they are not convinced by my own explanations. And it's fine because we are a democracy, because ZANU-PF brought democracy in this country, and therefore it must allow that other parties must exist and that other parties, other individuals may not support it. So the same principle applies here. There are many people who work here, who I don't believe, if they stayed in Younger South, they would vote for me because I'm a ZANU PF candidate. But they still have a job here. They know, and I think in their own conscience, they know that if I, we are being uh, 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 pushed to put a political agenda, we will leave our jobs and go. So we have not had that problem because we believe in objectivity, in fairness, in balance, in terms of what we do. And because the bulk of what we do is not editorially driven, it's entertainment driven. So we play all kinds of music. We have DJs, we have presenters who come from different backgrounds. Our news is about anything in, that happens in this country, which we believe, which our editors believe, is of interest to the Zimbabwean audiences and the Zimbabwean public, both in Zimbabwe and in the diaspora. Because we have a huge listenership, listenership uh, by those in the diaspora because they follow us online. So you would say our news and current affairs is balanced? I would say that to uh, uh, a great extent, we try to make, ensure that there is balance and we try to ensure that there is objectivity and we try to ensure that both sides of the story are presented. And I'll give you a very recent example. I understand there was a, an organization that wanted to run a program uh, and that this program was looking only at uh, or talking only to victims of a particular incident. Right. And I said, okay, can we also have on the program those that are allegedly the perpetrators so that we have both sides of the story? So my view is that there's nothing sacrosanct, there's nothing sacred about coverage here as long as both sides of the story are represented. And I think that that's the expectation of any Zimbabwean. Anyone in ZANU-PF don't mind being criticized, but they also want to hear their voice being aired. Anyone in C in the MDC, don't mind, in my view, to be criticized, but they also want their voice to be heard. So my thrust is a healthy country, 
A healthy democracy always hears both sides of the story. Let the people make their own decision on who's right and who's wrong. Mm-hmm. There is a um, general perception lately that ZFM standards have gone down in terms of, you know, the quality on air, a number of names that were on ZFM a few years ago, they have left, people are leaving. Uh, what is it? Is it quality of management? Is it the quality of on-air personalities? How would you respond to that? I think what happens is that when you run a race of 10 years, you get a lot of fatigue along the way. People get tired. People begin to look at themselves as individuals and say, what is my future? How do I uh, be better than where we are? And then people look at also the economic environment. Uh, Are we going to be able to uh, uh, build houses, uh, look after our families in this kind of situation? So you are right. A number of people have left, Mm -hmm. but I'll tell you the bulk of people have left to go to South Africa. Some have gone to the USA. Some are looking for greener pastures outside of our country. And a big number of people who have left were uh, handpicked or headhunted by some of the big media organizations in this country. I can tell you one a big organization that just came to offer everybody a job here because they were starting a new TV station. Why do they come here? Because we have a knack for identifying good talent. We don't recycle talent. We don't We don't normally go out and pick people mm-hmm. from other stations. That is a we strength pick, of ZFM. We pick people from the streets and mm-hmm. we make them global stars. Uh, but is it not now is not now a case of zfm being like you said handpicking talent nurturing the talent and then they go to excel somewhere else we don't mind because this country has got so many other people who are talented if we become the organization well known for picking good talent that other people can pick that talent that is okay that is our role in society we identify people who have who would not have had a chance if they are seen by bigger organizations that's what we want because the pool from which we are getting these people is huge. So we don't mind that. Of course, we would like to retain a lot of the good skills, Mm -hmm. but the issue is in a country where there's a lot of good skills, you should never worry about where people go. You should always worry about your ability to renew yourself. So to just go back to your question, because I don't think I'd answered it fully. You said uh, the standards have gone down. No, Mm -hmm. 10 years, people get a little bit tired. So. What does that mean? It means the 15th of August, a few days ago, is restart button press. So you will see a number of changes are are taking place. New management is taking over, a new lineup on air. We're taking things to a bigger level. Last 10 years, good years to learn, good years to make mistakes. But next 10 years is gonna be 10 years of progression, of growth, of momentum, huge momentum, and doing things bigger and better than we have done in the last 10 years. Every organization goes through that cycle. And I think that uh, uh, ZFM has been at that stage where it needed a restart. And what better time to have a restart than on the 10th anniversary? So in your in your opinion, um, having to change face every now and then is not a reflection of standards going down at all? Absolutely. Having to change as you go on means that you are just adapted to the environment. The majority of our population is young people. Right. When we started with very, very, you know, very experienced and sometimes old guys, mm. but they are no longer in touch. After 10 years, you're not in touch with the young people. So, but our station appeals to young people. So we want to bring, bring the young people who understand and who know how to dance to Ama Piano, you know? So those are the ones who- Do you think your audiences and your clients understand this? I think the audiences and clients do understand this because what the audiences, what, what do clients want? Clients don't like us. They like the people who listen to us. Mm-hmm. Those are the people they want to reach to. We're just the bridge which they use to reach those people. So as long as they know we're reaching to the young people and they're speaking to their peers on the station, they will come through to us. But if they, we have old people trying to speak to young people, there's a disconnect. So they will not come to us. If they don't understand, we, we are always uh, uh, available going around in the, in the various uh, uh, corporate offices to explain what it is that we are trying to achieve and how we will achieve their ends, their objectives, and our objectives at the same time. 
Welcome back to Business Unusual. I am Mona Lisa Dube and we are celebrating ZFM Stereo's 10th anniversary. And my guest today is the founder of ZFM Stereo, Super Mandiwanzira. Now, we've spoken about a bit of the background of ZFM Stereo and I think you have touched a bit on your, your vision. I think we'll go into that. But it wouldn't make sense for me not to speak about you as a politician now that I have you on, on this platform. Uh -huh. We have seen your name on all different kinds of lists in the past few years, you know, mm -hmm. lists of people that have amassed wealth using public funds, lists of people that uh, borrow money from the local banks and use political muscle not to return the money. Mm -hmm. Is there any truth in any of this? Absolutely not. Um, I think that, uh, like I said at the, uh, uh, earlier on in the, in the first segment, we have become a very polarized nation, uh, a nation that doesn't seek facts when it comes to political figures, uh, a nation that satisfies itself from propaganda. You know, the Chicagoans were Jakaipa about a politician. Mm -hmm. We're so comfortable and happy we go and sleep well. We are no longer a nation that seeks the truth, that seeks facts, that seeks... How so we are trying to seek the truth and facts right now. Yeah, but I'm just generally explain, explaining why you've come across those things that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that you asked this question because it's important to set the record straight. I have never benefited from any tender. As a person, as a businessman, I did not tender and I got a superman do and do more women. If you didn't know to ramari go as a government minister, when I was appointed minister, deputy minister and minister, I used even my personal car in order to get work moving. I put my own fuel sometimes. But ministers are given cars, aren't they? I went for four, five months without a new car. But eventually you did receive a I vehicle. I did receive, mm -hmm. but I never got paid or compensated for the use of my vehicle. I don't mind because that's my contribution to society. There are people who contributed to this country with their lives. Some contributed with... Uh, uh, limps who have no have, have no legs. They came back from the war, so it's nothing. It's nothing contr uh, to contribute if, uh, your car to to the goodness of the country. So I'm not complaining. So I've never in that in those positions been given anything or a tender by government directly or indirectly. Never asked my relative to supply a bundle of vegetable to a government entity never i was surprised i saw i saw on the internet a house with like i don't know 10 15 cars and it was being put out there as superman so it's house. not yours it, the, absolutely and and thankfully i know who owns that house is my good brother chamuchi and uh, you know we always laugh about it why people give me your house <laughs> and never live there you know so uh, you you have this as something that people believe their super mm. because some guy sitting under a bridge just upset against super minister so because sometimes we are very gullible as Zimbabweans but it's nonsense I don't own that house and my brother Cham has worked hard to build that and Moti so imagine my, my, my kids have kids who go to school, primary and secondary. They, they, they are taunted because mm. but the, the truth of the matter is, you know, they know we don't live in the house. They know our father doesn't drive so many cars. Uh, it's, it's, it's that uh, a toll that it takes on you as a person and as a family when, you know, all these things are thrown. So to answer your, your question, I've never borrowed from any bank and, and failed to pay. I, in fact, as it stands right now, I owe no bank any money. So you it have borrowed and returned the money? As a business person, you borrow and you return the money. That's why we're still in business today. Mm -hmm. We borrow money, we return the money. And akuna bengri nungo pa mari yore ga uzoswa. Yoto nze bengri no nyarari rai zozo. There's nothing like that. Akuna bengri uru mende in this country. Tell me which which bank is owned by the government in this country. I'm not going to go to one another. Akuna, there's so much professionalism in our financial sector. That those things don't happen. They don't happen at all, or you're just saying in this particular case you did not. No, but if you're saying you, found, you saw a story that said I got a loan from a bank and yes. pay back, and I'm saying no bank gives anyone money and doesn't pay back. This is different from people who may have benefited from a government program, and 
then the government writes off that debt. That I I'm not part of that. What if if that is what you are, uh, are saying? I'm mm -hmm. simply saying you have told me that there are articles you have read that say Ndagano Kirita Mahari. I also saw one article that said I took money from CBZ and didn't pay back. That's mm -hmm. nonsense. I mean, CBZ would have come after me. They would have sold my property uh, because you don't get money without providing security anyway. What is the business of banks? It is to lend money, but they also do it prudently. So I have borrowed from banks and I've paid back the money that mm -hmm. I've ever borrowed. And um, under the late uh, former president, Robert Mugabe, you are you were the minister of ICT. And at some other point, you were the deputy minister, as deputy minister, minister of, of information. information. And then you were then uh, put as a minister of ICT right. uh, until uh, President Emerson Nagagwa came on. He retained you for a couple of months and then he replaced you. Did that bother you? No, it didn't bother me because I had a conversation with the president about it. In fact, uh, I went to thank him for having appointed me and having worked with him very closely, both under President Robert Mugabe, because I reported to him when I was the Minister of ICT, all the economic clusters, ministries would report to the Vice President. So I worked very well with him. Mm -hmm. And when he came in uh, as the President uh, to finish the term of uh, former President Mugabe, he retained me as the Minister of ICT. Yes. I worked with him very well again. And then when uh, we came to o August, September of 2018. I was not retained. I went to express my gratitude to the president that I, as a young man, am very proud of the record that I've had that in the independence of Zimbabwe, I served under the two leaders, President Mugabe and himself, and I wanted to thank him for the opportunity he had given me to work with him mm -hmm. and to let him know that I will continue to serve the country in many capacities, especially business. And he was very kind to me and explained to me uh, why he hadn't appointed me. And I was very grateful for his explanation, but I didn't mind. Do you not... want to share with us why well, you were not, not sure. retained? <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure it's 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 the platform why we, we should share my conversation with the president. But he did explain to me and it, it did nothing to do with anything, it did nothing to do with my performance. It had everything to do with the fact that he was minimizing the size of the cabinet and he was picking uh, just two ministers from each province. So if you actually look at it, Manikland, I think, had four or five ministers, some of them very high powered, including former finance minister Chinamasa. He didn't come back. I didn't come back. So why would we make that an issue? So as a young man, I saw this as an opportunity to go and do more business and support the president and support the party in many ways. I don't believe that you can serve your country by just being a minister or by just being an MP or just by just being somewhere close to the cabinet. I think you can serve this country well by being elsewhere. Mm -hmm. How how well has Strive Masiwa served this country? Hugely. Is he a minister? Is he, is he an MP? He's never. So, like I said, again, we kind of put so much into politics and we think everything is about politics. I don't think like that, you know. So a lot of people who, who meet me these days say, ah, you know, we thought you'd be looking like, <laughs> you'd be looking like uh, this struggling, starving guy. I said, no, 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 I'm very content and comfortable with the life that I lead and the support that I give to my government. Would you like to be in cabinet again if the opportunity presents itself? I'm not looking to be in cabinet again. I'm not seeking a position to be in cabinet again. It is only up to the president if he sees that there is a role that I am capable of for him to make the decision to call me if necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not uh, about to seek a position in government. I'm very content with what I'm doing right now uh, and uh, I'm serving him in uh, in this respect in a commercial sense. So we put up a post on our Twitter and Facebook as mm -hmm. we were preparing to have you on the program and uh, some of the listeners sent through their questions. We have a question on Twitter from at uh, Gramu Gandari. Why does AB Communications not have a board of directors 10 years into existence? Um, it is not a fact that it, uh, AB doesn't doesn't have a board, but I guess uh, it comes from the point that he doesn't know. Mm -hmm. And I can't blame him. Probably we should blame ourselves because we haven't talked about our board that much and, and, and sold it out there to, to our audiences. But we do actually have a board. Uh, our board currently comprises of uh, 
Belinda Muswaka. She is a chartered accountant. She actually also sits on the board of the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. She's the chairperson of the AD Communications Board. Uh, we also have Chipon Ludzo, a well-known uh, HR uh, expert. Uh, she runs a very huge enterprise called uh, Providence. She's one of our board members. Then we, we also have a, a, a lawyer, uh, Fungai Chimomorombe, who sits on our board. We have Robson Mandiwanzira sits on our board, mm -hmm. and we have Yamekani Mandiwanzira who also sits on our board. Mm -hmm. So we do actually have a board, and uh, they're doing a great job, if I must. Okay, so just to put it in perspective, AB Communications is the parent company for um, ZFM yes, Stereo. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, this is from Agrippa on Twitter. In the past year, I have been listening to ZFM and my only disappointment is the news slot. It is so biased towards an PF. Do you see ZFM broadcasting more balanced news? We did tackle this uh, mm -hmm. question. Uh, it's very difficult to be everything to everyone when you are in the media. One day, somebody will see you as being biased towards that one. The other day, somebody is on a PF who will say, ah, oh, you know, your station is attacking us. So it's always very difficult. But as I said, the effort is always to be balanced. And my uh, uh, message to the entire team in the editorial division of, uh, of this company is always, guys, there's no subject that you should be scared to cover. But when you cover that subject, make sure that there's balance. Make sure that both sides of the story are given equal time so that people make their own judgments. So mm. we will continue to strive uh, to, to strive for that. Tatenda Gondo says that why is there no coverage in rural areas uh, of ZFM or rural growth points? There is, uh, to a very large extent, coverage of ZFM in many, in many areas. But given the... Um, so sometimes we, we, have a, we have a transmission issue where some areas have got pockets that don't get the uh, coverage because they are either uh, in valleys and the signal doesn't quite cover that area. So it's always a, a, a problem sometimes when you are traveling, they say, oh, we haven't had ZFM. And you, you find, oh, no, I better up up ZFM, particularly because, you know, Jamba area. Those don't talk about my cell phone. But area, I don't know. A, a booster actually reports to go on, but I scoop up. We're not very far from the booster, but Panapa is Kubata. It's again coverage, actually, technically, Pane language. I know Shangisa. So sometimes we have those challenges, but we would like to know where there's this mm -hmm. uh, a, a yearning for ZFM where there's no coverage. If people can send uh, communication, we will then talk to our chief engineer at Hosotole to see what can be done in those areas to make sure that uh, this coverage is widespread. It's very important uh, uh, for people to understand that. Uh, our value comes from the amount of people who listen to the right. station. So the more we can have more people listen, the better for us as a station. So we have interest in covering all the rural areas. So if you're in an area where you do not get ZFM signal, sometimes do let us know, uh, 0731 uh, And a question from Amos, who is, we got it from Facebook. Please ask him what he thinks about media freedom in Zimbabwe. I think that there's the enormous media freedom in this country. I think that uh, you look at uh, the publications we have here and what they say about the president, what they say about the ruling party, what they say about the opposition, what they say about opposition figures, they pretty much say what they want. In fact, uh, sometimes when you're reading, you get so upset. How can they say this about the president? Or how can they say this about the first lady? Or how can they say this about another human being? So the fact that you can go and publish that and you're not arrested i think that speaks volumes about the media freedom in this country i think that um, we, we we tend to also from a media perspective uh, uh to um we tend to to exaggerate what media freedom really means a, i have had the experience of working uh for big global organizations there are issues you don't cover or mm. the issues that they will not they will not cover. Um, uh, I can just give you an example. Why do we not watch uh, uh, Russia today? Why are we not watching it on DSTV? Why is it no longer available on DSTV? Why is it no longer available on YouTube? Russia today. Why? Because somebody decided we should not listen to the Russian side of the story. Is that media freedom? No, it is not media freedom. So. I think we tend to exaggerate what we should have as media freedom in Zim. Uh, when you have a whole global entity 
telling us that uh, you cannot uh, listen to a channel because it is not saying things that they like. And we are cut off watching Russia today as a whole nation or as the whole African continent. That speaks volumes about lack of media freedom. But do we have we been cut off any channel in Zimbabwe? Have we been cut off ZBC? Have we been cut off any newspaper? No, we haven't. So I think we do have pretty much very significant media freedom in our own country. Uh, there's a comment here from Sak Chaser from Facebook. Personally, I do not have a question, but a compliment on him managing a decade nonstop and keeping Z a competition station, among others. Keep up the good work, he Thank says. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And then, constituent constituents, when you hand Z, this is from Clyde. Ask him about the Bender people in Yanga. There's a lot that he promised but did not fulfill from the roads that lead to the remote area and the development that he said he will do? Uh, I don't know the specifics of that question, mm -hmm. but if he's talking about Bende, uh, he will know that uh, I single-handedly ensured that uh, there is a community health post at Bende. I know the difficulties that people at Bende face. I made sure that there's a community health post. Since independence in 1980, the people traveled a very treacherous road to go to the nearest clinic. I changed all that and I put one there. Uh, and the road uh, from Charamba right up to Bende has been fixed. But of course, because of the huge trucks that are annually going up to pick up timber there, the road is always damaged and always requires constant attention. Mm -hmm. And I, I have had a, uh, many letters of appeal to Allied Timbers because they're the biggest beneficiaries, the forestry at Bende is theirs, to say, can you contribute to the rehabilitation of this road because the trucks that are damaging this road are your business. So we continue to have this conversation with Allied Timbers. Sometimes they are very uncooperative, sometimes cooperative. So it's a, it's a continuous conversation. Uh, I also then need to point out to the person who asked that question, I don't promise things personally because as a person, I have no resources to meet everyone's expectation. But what I promise as a member of parliament is to fully represent them. So I get their concerns, they get their com problems, I take them to the relevant ministries. I take them to the Ministry of Transport, I take them to the Ministry of Health, I mm. take them to Parliament. But it is not my role to find money in my pocket to come and build uh, a clinic. Right. But when I can, because I've been privileged or I have been favored by God in one respect or the other, when I do it, it mustn't be seen as that is a responsibility. It is me contributing and thanking the community mm -hmm. for supporting me and supporting my ruling party. And, and speaking of parliament, we also saw your name on the list of members of parliament who have never contributed much on on, on maybe debates, etc. Well, I, I, I do contribute to debates. I uh, make a lot of uh, contributions, especially in the ICT portfolio committee. Uh, I, I, it's just that people think that parliament it is is only on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. No, Parliament does not happen only when it is live on, on, on the TV. It happens uh, every other day. And I do make contributions. I comment on the President's speech and, and I've made those, uh, uh, those, those, uh, those, those, those contributions. But sometimes I also find some of the conversations that we have, especially when the cameras are on, to be unproductive. And I, I sometimes I choose not to be part of an unproductive conversation because people just want to say things because they want to be seen on TV. <laughs> I've, had, I've been on TV and uh, I don't want to just say things because I want to be seen on TV. I want to make a contribution that is relevant. I want to make a contribution that makes the people of Nyanga And you think some of the con you think some of the conversations do not produce anything for the people of Zimbabwe. I can tell you on many occasions when the cameras are on on a Wednesday, there are lots of other people who just want to say things so they are seen on TV. That's my own assessment. And I don't want to just do things for TV. I want to do things because I genuinely want to say those things. There are people who say very important things on parliament, in parliament during the, uh, 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 the, the question time with ministers very, who raise very legitimate issues and speak serious issues. But there are also others who are just time wasters. And that, that's what I have observed. And I don't want to be part of a... A, a, a group that is, is just making a contribution for the sake of being seen 
on live TV. No, mm. I wonder I who those are. I really wonder who those are. I, I don't need to tell you by name. Just mm. watch uh, uh, live. Uh, you can tell on your own. You don't need me to tell you because it's public. Right. Um, Gerard Boka on Facebook says, congratulations, Honorable Superman Wanzira. Continue to inspire us. Next, we need a television station. Thank you very much. Any chance of getting into television? We did um, uh, uh, put our uh, application when uh, the opportunity opened. Uh, unfortunately, this time around, we were not successful, which again speaks to the fact that even if you're Zanu PF, you can still lose. <laughs> so we lost the, the right to set up TV, ch TV channel. We didn't. But with a lot of hindsight, we are very glad we didn't because TV has changed. Um, in fact, uh, I think that uh, setting up a TV channel in the manner that had been envisaged in the licensing uh, uh, framework uh, is increasingly becoming not the route to go because TV has changed from the TV in your house. Kudara mm. wanuai vakuba sauta kunona TV kumba. But today na anona TV pa laptop yake, anona TV pa phone yake, anona TV on an iPad or any of those kind of gadgetry. Saka, do you want to build an infrastructure, my transmitters, to distribute TV that other way? Or you want to be able to create content and then share it on the various platforms that are now available? Because the video platforms have moved from television. There is now a convergence. Content, you don't want to TV, you don't want phone. But you don't need the infrastructure of the TV to be able to watch content. So is this the route you're taking with ZFM Stereo? My view is that, uh, with, with a lot of hindsight, the, the view is that, uh, in fact, the future is content than it is infrastructure. Two infrastructure, one listener. So you can distribute, you can have a TV channel on YouTube. You can have a TV channel you don't build anything. I wanna fight by our I wanna see what is the channel you about YouTube and people are already watching and you are being paid. So this is the direction you're going. That's the direction I would uh, I would push for uh, AB Communications to look at. Mm -hmm. But we don't uh, again uh, dismiss the opportunity for working with others who are, who are licensed in terms of creating and developing the content. And we have already had some approaches by some of the people to see how we can work together, and we are pursuing those vigorously. So as as we wrap up, uh, Honorable Man Wanzira. Uh, 10 years down and a more years to come for ZFM Stereo. What should people, listeners of ZFM Stereo expect in the turn of the new decade? I think that the specifics, you would need to speak to uh, the guys who run the show. But in terms of just the big picture, the big vision, I think that we are aware and alert to the fact that there is also a transformation of radio. Radio is no longer what we used to know it as, where people would just listen to radio because that's the only channel available. Radio is now available from anywhere. Somebody, young man in a, in a garage can start his own radio channel, which is all online. Uh, you know, it's easy now. You know, they've been gambling, which is about power on my license. Somebody sitting in London can start a license, can start a radio just to broadcast it to Zimbabweans. So our content is going to separate us from all those kind of platforms. So our radio is going to be more content driven, more people driven. The broadcasters are not going to be us, they're going to be the people. The broadcasters are not going to be the people who are always in front of the microphone, they're going to be the people who are out there. Because people want to hear themselves, they want to see themselves, they want to associate with uh, entities or with platforms where they are a part of. Not Kuti, Mujangoti broadcast, it. So I think the thrust going forward is going to be uh, more people-driven content, more uh, uh, content development, content creation, pushed not just through the radio platform, but pushed through even social media platforms. People must be able to watch radio. Okay? I hope you get what I mean. What we are doing now must be, must be live on, on, on YouTube, but we are on radio. Yes, this so, is exactly what we're doing. Th that's exactly what we're doing. Mm. But, but I'm saying that is the future. That's where we are going. That's what we want to develop. Uh, that, that's the business model we want to develop. Mm -hmm. And we want to be more relevant to businesses. We want to be more relevant to our audiences. We want to be more relevant mm -hmm. to the country. We want to respond to the issues. What are the real issues in this country? The issues are 
economic bread and butter. Some will say it's politics. Politics is nothing. Bread and butter are the key issues. When I say about us interested in politics, people become interested in politics when bread and butter issues are not clear. So it's just we want to provide the platform for people to understand that the solutions are within ourselves. Solutions are in bread and butter issues. Let's fix those. That's why we have programs like uh, 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 Enterprise Zim, because we're trying to encourage small businesses to do something because the opportunity is there. And the opportunities are not just in Zim, they're everywhere. I know people will say, oh, no, but you know, it's difficult to even start because things are already difficult. You must ask why the Chinese still come here, why the Indians still has come here, why the Pakistanis still come here, because they see opportunity. And I, there's a question that I think I should have asked earlier on in the program that I think let me... So you still have an yes. It, yeah. um, what is the target audience for ZFM Stereo? Because there's this perception that ZFM, Dema Saladi, you have to sound a certain way for you to be uh, on ZFM. Maybe just let's just clarify that. Well, it's, it's ZFM is for everyone, but Kanatikadi Wani Masaladi more, we don't mind. Uh, ZFM is really meant to uh, excite, to be... Uh, the station of choice by young people. And when we say young people, we're talking 18 to 35 to 40. Do and I take a target. I love to a music that you play and do any those are no days. But in the process, there are many people who are young at heart, who are over 45, who are over 50, who are young at heart. We're still reaching out to them. There are many people who are below 18 uh, who listen to our radio shows, who are listening. Uh, in their parents' cars as they are being driven to school who love the station. We don't mind. So we make it for everyone. But our target is what I've said to you. Well, of course, there are people who have then given us the perception that we 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 only appeal to those north of the railway line. But I can tell you, in the Akurura Ghetto, Akurura Sakuba, Akurura Bangambura, so those who are game around are going to go. But I'll tell you, so be roji, so be a railway line to end up my deal deal. So those people are aspirational. So we are an aspirational station. So we want, we capture those people. So we, we want to them lead to want them to listen to the station, aspire a lifestyle, Kawano associate on the ZFM. And then we, we, we take the nation uh, with us along. Honorable Superman Wanzira, founder of ZFM Stereo. Appreciate your time with us here on Business Unusual. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a great pleasure. And that's all we had for you as we celebrate ZFM Stereo's 10th anniversary here on Business Unusual. I'm Mona Lisa Dube. Stay with us here on ZFM Stereo.